Good afternoon, Infotech. Before we begin this afternoon's programming, I wanted to stop in and introduce myself. My name is Maria Brady, and I'm the Director of Relationship Management here at the AIM Institute. I'm so proud to work with AIM on its mission of building a strong and diverse tech workforce here in the greater Omaha community. And I'm very excited to share this mission with you as members of our tech community who know the power of what a career in this field can do for your life. AIM's goal is to take away the barriers that prevent others from gaining a foothold in this field, from focusing in on childhood STEM education to assisting first-generation college students and, of course, for offering scholarships to our accredited code school. The other fun aspect to the work we do, though, is bringing tech professionals like you together for events like this today. So once again, thank you for joining us virtually for InfoTech this year, and we look forward to seeing you at future AIM events. But before I let you go, I want to give a quick thank you again to those who have donated to our raffle today, and to remind you that there is still a chance for you to make a donation and enter to win. The winners will be announced right before our Code School graduation later this afternoon. With that, I will let you go, but I hope to see you around Infotech and come see me in the networking sessions later on this afternoon. Thank you. Hi, and welcome back. Good afternoon. I'm Vonda Page. Innovation doesn't have to suck. It's easy to become frustrated about the pace of innovation, but there is a better way. And I've learned that the key to driving and sustaining innovation is deeply embedded in understanding how to lead change. Our approach can impact the outcome for every effort, every program, and every project that we undertake. So a little bit about me. As I said, my name is Vonda Page, and I'm a leader, a technology adoption expert, a strategic advisor, an innovator, a founder. I've recently founded a startup. I'm a learner, a mentor, a coach, a mom, and my new favorite title is STEMinist, which I learned about at the Nebraska Robotics Expo. The title that I've officially had for the longest time, though, is as an organizational change manager, or what people call OCM. So, what is an organizational change manager? So an organizational change manager is a person that positions organizations, teams, groups, um, and, and companies for success so that change doesn't have to suck. So what does that look like? Well, when a company in, endeavors to make a transition, whether they're talking about building something new, transforming the current process, or even creating a better way, it's all about advancement. And so as an organizational change manager, what I do is I help assess, advise, coach, manage, track, and measure as companies, teams, or organizations are undergoing a change process. And this process could be around changing people, what they do. It could be around implementing a new technology or just doing something different. But the idea is that the end result is to be focused on achieving a benefit. And what I've learned is that as an organizational change manager, I've been on the front row as is seeing teams and organizations innovate some of the most amazing changes you can imagine. The tech industry, as we all know, has creative, innovative solutions for many of the world's most pressing problems. And we know that there are so many more problems which we continue to struggle. Some things like battery life. Seems like we might have gotten that figured out by now. HDMI, that's something that we're still struggling with. We have issues with data privacy, with cybercrime, and of course, inequality in tech leadership roles for women, as well as the gender pay gap and more. So I think that innovation is at the heart of any solution. And it's more than just building stuff. 
It's making changes to advance society. It's thinking outside of the box and looking for that unheard of or outlandish idea that when adopted could spur some really meaningful and radical change. And innovation is also inextricably linked to our collective advancement and progress because innovation isn't just about improving an app or making something go faster even when it comes to doing something great, like improving accessibility or running operations more efficiently. Even when you're accelerating a product launch to build some better brand quality or better brand loyalty, um, innovation is something that has more ties than just doing something new. Innovation is a key to us moving forward together. So why does innovation suck? Well, once we see an innovation and once we see a product and once we see the end result and we understand how it can help us and we've had the opportunity to use it, we get it. But the process is difficult. So what I've learned is that the reason the process of innovation sucks is really around bias. We have individual biases, which are the key culprit. And what I like to do is I like to describe bias in a different way. And I like to describe bias as our beliefs, our intentions, our attitudes, and our self-view. These are things that hold us back. And these are things that serve as, um, as challenges in creating innovative environments and creating innovation in our lives, whether we're talking about products, people, processes, or the way we think. So the good old days, right? The necessity, the necessity, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. So I don't know if anybody remembers things like the typewriter or the fax machine or the word processor. Um, and I don't think any of us here today are going back and saying, wow, I really miss that typewriter. That typewriter was everything. Or the fax machine. One of my actual first jobs was um, at an insurance company when I was a 10th grader in high school. And the second or third day on the job, we got a fax machine. And it was my job not only to use the fax machine, um, but to also teach the rest of the employees how to use the fax machine. Needless to say, um, it was challenging because this was in the 80s and we were still used to snail mail. We were used to um, sending um, uh, telegrams um, and, and a lot of very slow things. So when the fax machine came along, it was seemed to be revolutionary. However, it was challenging. It was challenging because we were doing things differently. And it took months to get the customers used to it. It took months for me to learn how to troubleshoot when faxes didn't come in, when faxes didn't get to their destinations. But it was a process of innovation. And when um, I've spent most of my career as that technology adoption manager and leader. And so I've gotten the opportunity to see new technology uh, hit the office, hit the company, hit the team, and then how people gradually learn to adopt and use it and then sustain use of that new technology. And, you know, when you think about using new technology or doing anything, there's always a balance of what's happening in your personal life. So if you're frustrated, maybe because you were late to work and then the paper gets jammed, of course, you're going to be frustrated by that. But at the same time, we can take advantage of the advances that innovation has brought to us. The reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the reasonable man.
So let's talk about some innovation basics. So as I said, change and innovation are linked very closely. And just as with change being inevitable, it's doable, it's invigorating and satisfying, even, it, even so is innovation, even when it's hard. People who describe themselves as innovators are often the greatest people who are averse to change in their personal lives. The key to it is the biases that they have, their beliefs, intentions, attitudes, and self-view. Self they may believe that they have an idea that is the only idea. They may believe that only they can implement it, but they may be trying to think of it in a change way where people become afraid of the process. But just like change is inevitable, so is innovation. And what I've learned is that change and innovation both occur regardless of your bias towards them. So embracing change is, and embracing innovation and change is doable. And what it requires is a relentless pursuit of information and good data so that you can drive toward the outcome you want. The second thing is that when you are engaged actively in innovation, even when it's something extremely difficult, something like working to, you know, save our planet from the impact of global warming or, uh, you know, updating accessibility options for people to use um, much needed apps. These things, even though it could be slow in making the progress, they will be invigorating once you get them done. It's also very satisfying, especially when you see large scale, complex and high impact innovation occur over time. When we think about innovation, whether we're talking about it from a science, technology, engineering and math perspective, or if we're talking about it from innovation in things in terms of human rights across the world, or criminal justice reform, or anything that has made significant impact. It's taking multifaceted, coordinated, and sustained approaches in order to be effective. But the great thing and the best news about innovation, the way I see it, is how invigorating and satisfying it is when you do something amazing, when you build a, a vision-saving medical technology, when you uh, give birth to a new dream or an idea that you had, where you can see infinite potential. And when you think about you know, not innovating and you think about not moving forward, it definitely is... Um, it's something that would keep all of us collectively from being our best selves. When you think about, or when you look at history, innovation doesn't just come from giving people incentives. Um, it doesn't come from just, you know, saying, well, if you do this, you'll get that. Innovation really comes from creating environments where people uh, can come together and ideas can connect. So what does that look like? So first, I think it starts with culture. And when I say culture, I mean the environment, the practices, the people, the values, the traditions. What is the full on culture? Are people comfortable and confident? Do they feel like they uh, are Know, know what the goals are. Are they aligned to the expectations? Is a culture one that is communicative, communicative where everyone knows where we are, where we're going, and what their role is in getting there? Are people aligned? Do leaders actually walk the talk? And is everyone 
on the same page around the goals and the type of organization, the type of company, team, or group that they want to be. They always say time changes things, but actually you have to change things yourself. One of my favorite artists, Andy Warhol, said that. And it makes me think that innovation doesn't just happen. You drive innovation by leading the change that you want to see. What type of changes happen over time with no effort? I can't really think of any. Can you decrease the amount of effort uh, and cost to make a loan something over time? We can decide to do, uh, we can decide to increase our movement. Um, we can decide to practice more mindfulness, and we can practice or decide to get more sleep. But those things won't occur by just sitting back and doing nothing. We have to make a change. We have to do something innovative, and that, in addition to culture, it takes coalition. It takes a coalition. It takes a group of people focused on the same goals. So if you think about the environment being filled with that coalition of people who have adopted a similar culture, who are headed in the same direction, and even though their, their, their um, skills their contributions, their talent, their size, their shape, it could vary. But a coalition is at the heart of how things get done. You can't use up, create, uh, you can't use up, use up creativity, Maya Angelou said. The more you use, the more you have. Sometimes, and I know I've been in situations where I have felt stuck where I've said, oh, well, you know, I've thought outside the box. I have tried to be creative and, and come up with creative solutions. Um, and what we have to realize is that we can't use it up. There is always more. And when our environment is such that we have a coalition of people with us, we have a culture where creativity is the norm and creativity is welcome, then we will have more. And the more is what I call capacity. And I think that our capacity um, is built with cre creativity because as we're looking for solutions, as we're trying to innovate, we're asking questions. And the idea is to have the best possible opportunity exists for success to occur. So what does that look like? So it looks like people, it looks like processes, it looks like time, it looks like resources, it looks like um, cal calendar management, <clears throat> it looks like everything being taken into consideration. So the capacity to get things done. So if we're doing something like updating a, a, a system, let's say a simple upgrade. Now, maybe this isn't a big innovative uh, venture, but if we want to have a successful system upgrade, what are some things that we need to do? Well, we need to make sure that our teams have the capacity to get it done. So we may need to do things like ask questions about their current workload, or we may need to shift work around. We may need to examine a bigger picture of a lot of work that is happening and to make sure that the opportunity for innovation exists because the people doing the work, because the processes, because the systems and the structures are all in place so that innovation can happen. If we're doing something more complex, let's say you know, you're working on a platform modernization for a century old company that's really struggling to compete. Well, the capacity in addition to the resources um, has, has also have to be, how have you prepared your infrastructure? 
How have you prepared your environment? How have you prepared your customers, your um, employees, your vendors, and all of your stakeholders? So capacity is extremely important because there are a lot of gears in motion. And you can't do all the work necessary if you haven't ensured that the capacity exists. The best way to predict the future is to create it. So one of the expressions that I love um, is being the change that we want to see. So being the innovator that we want to see. That's what we can work on. That's what I'm working on personally and professionally. But it takes a lot of work. And to do that work, it is competence. And competence requires practice, 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 trying, failing again, staying up late, really learning as much as you can so that you can put those skills and talents in place. You need those structures as well as the strategies for competence to even flourish. You need to have the infrastructure for you, for you to de develop the competence. So how do you learn those skills? Do you need to take additional classes? Um, do you need to just really examine some of the latest um, ideas and thought leadership around those particular areas? But competence is key because you have to be able to use those skills in order to innovate. And building an environment of competence is key. Um, I'm sure people have uh, either had their um, subordinates tell them, hey, I'm doing more work than this person. Or maybe people can look at their teammates and, and feel, you know, well, this person shouldn't have this role because another person is better. And so competence within that structure, within your culture, within that environment is a key factor in innovation. There's a better way to do it, find it. One of our favorite technologists and inventors, Thomas Edison said that. And when you think about it, there is a better way to do everything. And I think that's one of the things that has driven me for um, driven me to a career in organizational change management, because it's really about looking at how what the plan is, how we are planning to do it. But how do we do it in a way so that it doesn't have to suck? And sometimes that really requires a lot of introspection and it also requires having those other pieces set up. So when you think about the culture, a culture of innovation, when you think about a coalition, people working together to drive towards that innovative solution that you're looking for. When the coalition has the true capacity to get it done, when they have the time, they have the space, they have the energy, they have the resources, they have the right structures and leadership in place that helps them have the competence, those skills and talents that they need. And all of that together allows you the opportunity to find that better way. And the way you know you can innovate, the way you can make that radical change, the way you know you can do it better is with conviction. It's everything combined. It is really building momentum. And when you have momentum and you can see that outcome, you're convicted and you feel that sense of conviction. And it's easier to forge ahead and be resolute because you've already done a lot of work and now you feel it and you're ready to move toward those innovative solutions in a resolute and serious way. Everything you've ever wanted is on the other side of fear. And when I think about 
some amazing products and projects that I'm working on. They're very innovative. And recently, I had several personal uh, tragedies happen, which made me really tentative about doing some things. Um, and even today, I wasn't sure if I'd have the time to prepare the presentation or even if I uh, would just have the headspace to make it happen. But, you know, even through all of that courage, um, through fear, through anxiety, through uncertainty, courage is really the thing that can drive our innovation, that can drive change, that can drive our desire and that process to build something completely new. Standing in the face of it is the only way that we are going to be able to do more. You know, it could be something um, like letting your boss know that you've improved on her patent, right? You might feel nervous about that um, because you respect this leader. You know that they are a proven technologist that have done some great things. Um, but you had some ideas. You had a coalition of people that helped you. You were in an environment and in a culture that really supported being able to come up with these innovative solutions. You built up the capacity and you have the confidence, which you've built through developing your confidence in how to do it. And so now, courage because you've decided that you're doing it. You've been resolute and you're convicted, but courage is the real thing. And it's hard, especially um, for women in technology sometimes to exhibit that level of courage because often there are not a lot of us in when we necessarily don't have enough opportunity to even um, put ourselves out there sometimes. But courage, in that face of fear and uncertainty, it helps to drive innovation. I um, am a Philly girl. That means I grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And um, I also am a sports person. And there's an expression in Philadelphia where we say Philly versus everybody. And so growing up in Philadelphia and being a sports fan, um, I wasn't only fans of Philadelphia sports teams, but I got to know some of the great athletes. And one of the things that the great one, Wayne Gretzky says, is that he skates towards the puck is going, not where it's been. And I think that is just incredibly insightful because it demonstrates that when you have your mind made up, you can take the action to back it up. And how confident, how confident is that? to have that commitment, right? So you're not going where the puck is. You're not looking at that. You're going to where, uh, you're not, you're going to where the puck is going and not looking at where it has been. So a lot of times we're in situations where people say, well, this works fine because this is how we've always done it. You have people okay with the status quo. And when you get to a decision point, Sometimes it's easier to do it the way that we've been doing it before, but it takes that courage to skate where the puck is going. And that takes commitment. And it takes commitment to innovate because you have to be as determined as possible. And that determination gets easier. And as you have all of those pieces, when you have the courage and conviction and competence, capacity, the coalition, and you're in that culture, you can be committed. Now, I'm not saying any of this is easy um, because we're fighting fires, right? Um, as we're trying to innovate and do work every day. Uh, you know, we are doing a lot of other things. We're trying to manage budgets. We're um, still adjusting to um, now, um, you know, the post-COVID pre-back-to-work era, right, for a lot of companies and organizations. And so there is a lot happening. But to have this environment, 
the environment to support innovation, the environment necessarily that we need in order to help us progress in our overall um, needs as a society. The way we need to think about it is that innovation doesn't have to suck, even though it's hard. We can learn the, to innovate better. So what does that look like? Well, learn as much as you can for as long as you can. And what I like to say is I like to say that we can study up. And the way we do that is to unpack our bias, right? We talked about bias being our beliefs, our intentions, our attitudes, and our self-view. So we can stretch beyond our own comfort zone and we can become knowledgeable and we can learn to lead through those certainties that we talked about around courage and commitment, conviction, competence, and capacity. The second thing we can do is we can lead. We can step up. We can take charge of the project, of our lives, our lives individually, of goals and of targets. We have to get uncomfortable. It might get dirty, especially as you lead and as you think towards that innovative end. I call it leveling up. Leveling up is really going to that next level. It's really, as you have thought through, learned, and, and understood your individual beliefs, attentions, attitudes, and self-view, you can go above and beyond to stretch your preparedness, to be bold, to take radical steps and not fear being a revolutionary, even though it's scary. It's okay to color outside the lines, to break barriers, to forge new ground, to define new boundaries, and explore new territory. There's nothing stopping you but you. You can achieve more. You can learn to lead innovation. And when we do so, it really enhances our ability to build some of those things that we say we want. More brand loyalty. That means customers, employees, and other stakeholders. And this translates to success. It translates to more abilities to achieve the goals and the results if you want. Innovation doesn't have to suck at all. You can study up so that you can learn. You can step up so that you can lead an innovative team by creating the environment that is going to help innovation thrive and you can level up. So that means breaking boundaries, going beyond your fear, really meeting courage, meeting fear with the, in the face, using courage to meet fear in the face. These things will help you get the ability and achieve those goals and results that you want. So I encourage you to study up, to step up, and level up so innovation doesn't have to suck. If you want to learn more or get in touch with me, please do so on LinkedIn. You can email me or um, reach out uh, in our chat to do um, a one-on-one uh, -on -one meeting um, in the Hopin platform. Um, or just catch up with me on LinkedIn. Thank you.